five minutes, and then if you, uh, you know, if you'd like to leave and, and do other things, you can. We have several engineers here tonight, and they all have uh, name tags on. If you have questions about the project or, or um, the issues that that have been uh, discussed here, you can talk to any of those engineers, and we will uh, be more than happy to give you all the information that we have. Um, when you signed in, there were some brochures that describe the project, and we also have some comment sheets. So if you'd like to make formal comments on the project, you can go ahead and take one of those uh, comment sheets, fill them out, either give them back to us tonight here or mail them in, and that way we can uh, take your comments. This is an informal public information meeting. There is no uh, formal section where people get to stand up and make uh, verbal comments for the record. As I said, if you have comments, you can, you can mail them in. And if you have questions, you can uh, talk to the engineers who are here tonight. So um, if, you, if, if it's okay with you and we don't wanna waste your time and we're happy to see you, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Mr. Sanjay Singh, who is the uh, senior engineer in charge of this project. Sonny. soon find out through their own experience the safety and traffic flow benefits and then show enthusiastic support for roundabouts thank you Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Craig. Uh, my name is Sanjay Singh. I'm an assistant regional design engineer with the New York State DOT at the Buffalo office. I'm also the project manager for this project. I would like to thank all of you for taking their time from your schedule to be present at this meeting and your interest in the transportation system. Before we proceed any further, I wanted to thank uh, the village of Fredonia for hosting us at this uh, historic building. And uh, for housekeeping purposes, the fire exit is through the door in the back to the exits marked outside. The restrooms are also outside the door, downstairs to the right. I would uh, like to introduce some, or recognize some of the uh, uh, folks present here from DOT some key people here. We have Howard McCulloch here. He's uh, from uh, DOT's Design Services Bureau from Albany. Uh, we have Susan Serde, our public information officer, and we have Mark Castengue, who is the CDN designer who's in charge of this project. This meeting has been held in an open forum format for the short few minutes from 4 p.m. What that open forum format means is that there are display boards showing project uh, details and other pertinent information that you can look at and you can speak one-on-one -on -one with some of the engineers who are present here. These are people with the name tag, as Craig explained. I hope you had a few minutes to talk to them and if you didn't get a chance to speak with one of us, we'll be here till 7 p.m. in between the presentations and uh, feel free to ask us questions. When you ent entered this auditorium, I hope everybody had a chance to pick up a brochure. This is what the brochure looks like. Before you enter this room, on, on the desk, there is a, at the registration desk, there is a uh, there's a pile of brochures. These brochures show you the a project location map, description of the project, a brief description about this meeting, a brief description about the alternatives, and where you may obtain further information. Inside the brochure, 
there is a comment sheet which looks like this. This comment sheet can be used to give us your comments. You can either write the, your comments and turn them in today, or you can mail them in. If you look at the back side of the comment sheet, it is pre-addressed to us. It has to be folded and a first-class stamp postage uh, placed on it before it's mailed. We would appreciate your comments by April 26th. We also have a stenographer present here, uh, sitting up in the front row. And if you feel more comfortable giving your comments to us via the stenographer, that is fine too. I will provide a brief description of the project, the genesis of the project, why we are doing it, what we are doing, what the current status is, and where we are headed. After that, we will also be providing more information on roundabouts. Uh, over the last few months, we have received numerous comments from the public about and, and, uh, expressing concerns about mobility and safety related to roundabouts. So we wanted to present you the information we have so, so that we can address some of the concerns that you have. Now, how did this project start? First, a description of what this project involves. Uh, it involves intersection of Route 60 and 20 in village of Fredonia and town of Pomfret, but it's a, a few, a, few, a, a, a little bit of, uh, there's a project segment of Route 60 north and south of the intersection, as well as Route 20 east and west of the intersection. The traffic volume here is about 23,000 on Route 60 heading north towards the throughway, and about 13,000 on Route 20 uh, west going towards Fredonia. It's about 13,000 going south on Route 60, and about 12,000, about 11,000 heading east on, uh, on, on Route 20 from the intersection. A few years ago, this intersection was flagged as a high accident location. And that prompted our traffic and safety office to begin a, a accident investigation. A three year period of accident data was collected and investigated and studied. The data showed that there were 102 accidents that took place within the limits of this intersection and the four approaches. Out of these 102, 61 were on the approaches and 41 were inside the intersection. The accident rate that was calculated showed that it, this has a higher accident rate, this location has higher accident rate than accident rate, uh, than the statewide average accident rate for a similar facility. Now, how do we calculate that? Whenever there is an accident, roadway accident, the law enforcement officer fills out a form called MV-104, Motor Vehicle 104 form. And that form ends up with the Department of Motor Vehicles, which turns it over to Department of Transportation so that we can look at safety measures on our roadways. As you know, Department of Trans one of the missions of Department of Transportation is to ensure safety for the traveling public on state roadways. So what we do with that data is we compile the accident record and categorize it by type of facility, four-lane highway, four, uh, two-lane highway, rural highway, inter, uh, in, uh, three-legged intersection, four-legged intersection, signal with, or uh, intersection with signal, with stop sign. So we have all these different categories and we come up with average number of accidents for each type of facility. For this location, the accident, calculated accident rate was how much, much higher than the statewide average for a similar facility. That's what started this project. That's when the project was assigned to our design office and we got involved. We looked at the, we looked at the accident investigation and we looked at the treatment. Now, Route 60 from north 
coming on the north, from the north side is a five lane facility, two through lanes in each direction and a center third lane. The other three approaches are one lane in each direction but widens just before the intersection. Out of the 50, out of the 61 accidents that happened on the approaches to the intersection, 54, which, uh, uh, were 54 accidents out of the 61 occurred because of the left turning movement into and out of the driveways approaching the intersection. And the study recommended installation of raised medians on those four approaches so that the access to those driveways would be right in, right out. Based on this treatment, we developed alternatives. The project alternatives that we developed, the first one is null, which is just for comparison purposes. The second alternative, marked number two, is is the one where, which proposes installation of raised median on all four approaches and leaves the intersection signalized as it is today. This alternative beats the project objective of reducing the uh, accidents, the, the left turning accidents, but it, is not, it was not considered feasible because this alternative introduces a mobility issue. As you know, there are trucks coming off the throughway, coming down on Route 60. If, we, if you put in a raised median, you uh, prohibit them from making a U-turn in the intersection and head back towards the throughway. For that reason, we came, developed a third alternative, which involved a roundabout. In this case, the signalized intersection would be replaced by a roundabout, and, the, and it would also include the raised median on the four approaches. We developed two, uh, two variations of roundabout. The first, alt the variation, first variation was 3A, which was installation of a single lane roundabout. When we did the analysis, we found that this alternative is, handles the traffic at all times except evening rush hour. At that time, the volume exiting, volume of traffic exiting the village of Fredonia entering the roundabout was exceeding the capacity for a single lane roundabout. For that reason, we developed a modified roundabout alternative. In this alternative, the roundabout will have two circulating lanes of coming out of the village to accommodate the heavy left turn movement and have single lane of traffic circulating coming in from the other three approaches. This alternative beats the safety, alter, um, safety objective as well as the mobility objective, and also it, hand, it is able to handle the traffic volume coming in from all four directions. This is our preferred alternative. This project, this alternative will cost around $3.4 million. This is the alternative that is shown on the display boards outside uh, and uh, inside the, uh, the hall here. Opera House. To construct this roundabout alternative, we do not need additional right-of-way for the project. Also, as part of this project, we will be building uh, hundreds of feet of uh, new sidewalk to improve pedestrian accommodation inside the intersection and the approaches. This is the, uh, the snapshot of the display board that's uh, out there in, uh, at this, just before the steps entering the room. Shows the proposed roundabout. This may not be as easily visible as the display board, so this is just for information purposes. If you want a closer look, you can look at the display board outside. Now we'll discuss the project st status. As I said earlier, the project was initiated a few years ago, about three years ago, as a result of a safety investigation. 
After that, in December of 2016, we had a public meeting, actually upstairs in the trustees' room in this very building. And, and we, we, provide, uh, we presented the project plans of that time. We received several comments at, uh, at that public meeting. We used those comments to make minor revisions to the plans and obtain design approval in March of 2017. In summer of 2017, concern was raised that our design had not adequately addressed the impact on area businesses. Consequently, we rescinded the design approval document and we uh, conducted more exhaustive investigation of the impacts. We drafted a new design report and we presented it to the public here in January electronically on our website, and three hard copies were made available at the village hall, town hall, and the library. Subsequent to that, we received dozens of comments, uh, which were all uh, aimed towards the roundabout. And there were a lot of concern raised about safety and mobility that would result from installation of a roundabout. That's what prompted us to have this meeting today. We wanted to present you information that we have on roundabouts, on our experience with roundabouts that we have constructed. There are over 20 here in Western New York and hundreds in, in New York State, thousands in the country. We'll be talking about our experience with roundabouts locally as well as nationally. I will be, I will be followed by Another speaker who is very much more knowledgeable about roundabouts. I will quickly go over the project status, the cost and schedule. As I mentioned, cost is about $3.4 million. The schedule, currently we are in preliminary design stage. We don't ha do not have design approval because we rescinded it last year. We hope to go into construction in fall of this year and have the project complete by 2019. And we are hopeful that we will uh, we'll be able to do that. And uh, I will briefly go over some of the key benefits of a roundabout. Now, why, does, uh, why is a roundabout considered safer? Now, if you approach an intersection, imagine the three movements, three possible movements you can make. You can either go through or make a left turn or make a right turn. Out of those three movements, the safest movement is a right turn. Now imagine an intersection where the only way you can get in or get out is by making a right turn. That's why, and that's what a roundabout is. That's why a roundabout improves safety. It's because the only way you can get in and out is a right turn not a left turn, not straight through. And because of that, because of that nature, the number of conflict points or potentials for one vehicle running into another at a four-legged intersection goes down from 32 conflict points to eight in a, in a roundabout. As a result, the a number of accidents drop. If you, as, as per national studies, this, this study uh, was done by National Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. As per their study of 23 intersections where they removed uh, uh, a traffic signal and installed a roundabout, they saw that total number of accidents dropped by 39%. Injury and fatal accidents dropped even more. And that's because getting in and out is by right turns. So the probability of head-on and right angle collisions, which are your most serious accidents, their, uh, their probability goes down a lot. That's why you have such a big drop in number of accidents and the severity. Finally, studies have also shown that mobility improves at roundabouts. Now, why, why does that happen? Well, if you, ha if you approach a traffic signal, let's say, in an off-peak period, out of the 24 hours of the day, 
at least 20 hours of 20 hours are your off peak that's when you do not have rush hour type traffic but if the light is red you have to stop you have to wait till it's green in a roundabout you don't have to do that and as a result the overall mobility increases in a, uh, when you place roundabouts that has been the experience uh, locally state uh, at the state level and nationally and uh, that's one of the benefits of uh, roundabout now as promised i will turn over the forum to mr howard mcculloch howard mcculloch is from our design services bureau he's nationally and internationally recognized as an expert on roundabouts he will present some information Want me to exit out? Okay. Hello, everyone. I wasn't expecting the 4.30 show, so I wasn't totally set up. So let me just put a remote in, so hopefully I won't have to lean over and advance the slides. Trying to cut down on my workouts today. Just, just take one second. My, my last time here was to come out and do a couple presentations for the Irving Roundabout. Is anyone here familiar with that one? All right, here's a risky question. What's the opinion? Too small. Oh. Why do you think that's too small? Is that because they have to use the truck apron, or even after that? Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm just yeah, right. I actually built that simulation, and those are the exact PM volumes. If you want, I can bring up the actual program and show you the vehicle inputs. Those are the exact PM volumes. Well, there's no reason for me to cheat the volumes and show something that's not going to be realistic. I'm sorry, but I just threw it up. Okay. Oh, well, I'd be more than happy to show you the model after I'm done presenting here. And All right, so here's the North American perspective. Hopefully, uh, people are familiar with signals. This is actually Legoland out in California. We're actually trying to get a Legoland brought to, to New York State. So you can actually have your little ones drive the, the signalized corridor. Uh, just north of the border, they decided to build a European perspective. I'd like to talk to Legoland if they come into New York to put this one in instead of the, the signalized corridor, rather have the little ones running around the roundabout. Circle intersection is nothing new, especially in this area. Olmsted, if people know that name, uh, you do have some existing circles. We actually have the first major traffic circle in the world, as most people tout it, I guess, with uh, Columbus Circle, early 1900s. We actually used to have guidance on designing traffic circles in our, our national guidance book. The only problem was, what's that? Right. Room to get around that circle. Oh, sorry. 
we can get off. A little more conflict points. But we'll, we'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll be more than happy to, to chat with you. You know, the problem with, you know, the old circles was we designed it based on having cars be able to come in, change lanes and weave, and then get out. There was like a weave length that we wanted. Well, as the number of cars got higher, the speeds of the cars got higher, the circles had to get larger and larger. And then you ended up pretty much entering an interstate with no acceleration lane. That's pretty much how the large traffic circles were operating. So they were inefficient and unsafe, so it's why we pretty much, we dropped the idea of the large traffic circle. Fortunately, Great Britain did not. They had thousands on the ground. They had to make them work. So they redesigned them, made them smaller, and made them all yield on entry. So you may have a, a line of cars trying to get into the roundabout, but the intersection itself will always function. A lot of times if people don't like roundabouts, they'll find a picture of the whole intersection locked. And that was back when circulating traffic actually had to yield to entering traffic, which caused that problem. Modern roundabouts first started in the U.S. in 1990. They started in New York State in 2000 in Kinderhook, New York, or uh, Kingston, New York. And I think the first ones in Region 5 were like 2004, 2005. And there are 24 roundabouts now in the, the Buffalo region. This is actually a similar roundabout to what's being proposed here. This actually has a, a double left where for the design on this one, this lane actually does not go left. It's only a right and through, and a left only leaving the village to give us an extra capacity. The other three legs are gonna have right turn only lanes added. I mean, I'd rather call this a single lane roundabout with one leg that has two lanes that actually go into the roundabout as compared to a multi-lane roundabout. This is actually the Irving roundabout. So five legs. People were concerned about that one. I came out, that was my last trip out here, and I think by the end of the day, no one was bothering to attend our public information meetings, which. Right, right, well, yeah, the, I'm not saying this is the best comparison to this location, but it is the closest. Would you do it again? That Absolutely. Is the yes. Get that information. Yes. Please come up and see me after the presentation. Definitely. Now this shows where the roundabouts are throughout the country. Now surprisingly, the East Coast and West Coast is pretty heavy. Normally, what the big challenge is for roundabouts is right away. You know, do we have the room to physically put in the intersection? When I think about the country cut up into thirds, the center of the the country, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas. To me, that's like a kid in a candy store for a roundabout designer, because right away is pretty, uh, pretty available. They're not going to be a 5:30 public comment. Yes. At 5:30, we're going to do this all over again. I, I, according to your notes here, it says speak before the audience during the public comment. Is that for you, or is that for us? <laughs> at at 5:30 or after the 5:30, you can talk to us one on one. Now this says you will be invited to use the microphone, and your comments will be recorded. Yes. We have a sound but you're asking us to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. You can talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. But that's not what your pamphlet if, if says. You have, if there's something that you'd like to say to the snot, we'll let you do that too. Um, no, we can't do that until we get through I understand that. But I just wanted to clarify that at 5.30, he should be able to speak like he is. At, at 5.30, we will take comments. Okay. Once, well, it'll probably be before 5.30. 
I think that the majority of us could do without this presentation. No, we all know yeah. what a roundabout no, is. That's not the way it's going to work. We're here to make a presentation. Ma'am, sir, is this getting shoved down our throats? It really feels like really. it. Really? It does. Yeah. We know what the roundabouts are. We know the qualities of them. There are other questions that I think everybody here has regarding intent and manifestation. I love roundabouts. I don't always love American drivers, being one myself. But if there's a good reason for this, and if there's a good motivation for this, then I think those are the kind of questions that the people here have. So I'm happy to listen to your presentation. I'm not sure that another crowd's going to come at 5.30. And I think people here, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I think people here are wondering, are we going to do this? And then are we going to do this again? Or once we finish this, can we have a public discussion? Once we finish this, if you'd like to make comments, you can make that. You can talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. We will redo the whole presentation at 5.30 because we said we would. All right, that, that's um, internally inconsistent. Yeah. That we means that he's saying one thing and then he's saying something else. That's, that's not really exactly. I, I just don't want to sit through this whole meeting if there's not going to be a public comment. Period. Yeah. He has already stated on multiple occasions that you will have the occasion for public commentary. Could we please let the gentleman at the lectern get on with his presentation? Well, with all due respect, that's not what he's saying. He's saying it's going to be repeated at 5.30, then after that... He's going to start it at 5.30 again, the presentation. Yeah. If we get to the presentation, I don't see any problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the leading roundabout states, if you travel outside of New York, which a lot of people probably do, you know, we're actually not one of the leading states. We're decent, but... And we have over 130 now on the ground. A lot of times now I have a hard time knowing where they all are because once they get to start you know, catching on off the state system, I only hear about them when someone actually sends me a picture or a design to review. Here are where the roundabouts are in New York State. You can definitely see Albany, pretty cluster of there, Long Island, and western New York. Uh, Rochester and the Buffalo office been pretty active building roundabouts. These are the list of the roundabouts across the state. Uh, people probably don't know our regions, but the Albany region is pretty much a whole sheet. Then Utica has a couple. Uh, we're trying to find places for New York City and Manhattan. Right away is a little tough. Rochester, about 12 or so. Buffalo has 24. Cornell has about 10. And Poughkeepsie area has about 10 as well. The Binghamton area has about uh, eight or nine, and then Long Island has quite a handful. Now, this is a little close-up of the, the Buffalo area, with the closest one being the Irving, round about there. Uh, Harlem has quite a few, that area. This shows the list of the 24 that I know of in, in the Buffalo area. Has anyone here not driven any of the roundabouts in this area? I'm assuming by now it's probably difficult to, to get around without hitting a roundabout at some point. All right, so here is our first roundabout. This is actually Kingston, New York. We took a large 660-foot diameter circle, replaced with one that was only 220 feet in diameter. And the hardest sell we had, or Discussion topic was taking a circle this big, replace it with one this big, and get more cars through it. People just did not want to accept that. Even though we showed the model, everything else, like, no, it's not going to happen. The reason why it works so much better being smaller is think about the old intersection. You came up here, if you had to stop for circulating traffic, these cars are doing 60. So it's like jumping out of the interstate with no acceleration lane. So unless you were a very aggressive driver, you waited and you waited for a gap. Now we make the circle so much smaller, it's more like finding a gap in a parking lot. Pull up to the yield line, you look left, if cars are doing 15 or 20, you roll out into the intersection. Like 
Okay, so for, for this roundabout, we learned a lot of lessons the hard way. You know, it's been a learning process. We actually opened this roundabout about three weeks after this picture was done. Lighting wasn't done, signing wasn't done, and three of the four legs have these right turn slip lanes. And a lot of cars actually went down the right turn slip lane and never hit the roundabout, and they didn't intend to turn right. So it was dub malfunction junction in the press. You know, we took a beating for a while, but learned a lot of lessons. And that was 2000. So we've been doing these now for. Uh, we'll, we'll get to, to businesses. This is actually out in Goal, uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. They even have a bike about. You know, roundabouts, why are roundabouts being considered? Number one reason is safety. If you slow the cars down to 20 miles an hour, it's hard to have a serious crash. Think about that. You know, with our cars today, if you slow all the cars down to 20, and now all the angles are kind of side swipe, low angle, it's hard to have a serious crash. You may have fender benders, but you know, the idea of an injury is pretty tough to achieve. You also get high capacity and low delay. Sonny mentioned about the delay off peak. I was, I had lunch at McDonald's just before this presentation. I'm sitting there watching traffic. A lot of times you get the left turn base going, you get one lane from two legs moving, everyone else is parked. You know, signals are pretty inefficient off peak. You know, who sat at a light two o'clock in the morning and no one else went through it? You know, I like to start running around with a stopwatch, start billing the state for the time that I spent sitting there. I never really thought about how much time I spent at traffic lights until I read the Snapple. If you read the Snapple bottle caps, they got the true facts on them. Number 73, I got it back at my desk in, in Albany, states that the average person spends two weeks of their life waiting at a traffic light. I'm like, hmm, that piqued my interest. If I'm lucky enough to drive for 60 years before someone takes my keys away, that's less than a minute a day. I'm doubting not too many people in this area only sit at a traffic light for a minute a day. During peak hour, it's probably as efficient as it can be. Off peak, you know, there's a lot of time that, that could possibly be benefited from if a roundabout was there. Roundabouts are good for all modes of traffic. Uh, you also have a lot of geometric flexibility. They could be oval, oblong, teardropped. And aesthetics, roundabouts are a pretty form of intersection control. Also, if you lose power, they're not so, uh, you know, hit so hard as compared to a signal when it goes dark if we have a power outage for some reason. All right, crash statistics, already mentioned, covered this one, so I'll skip that one. This is another one showing the type of crashes as far as total injury and property damage only, just shows it for uh, the study of eight single lane roundabouts. So not exactly what we have here, but pretty close. This is actually a study from the state of Maryland, one of the leading states for roundabouts. They actually looked at the roundabouts in 2004 and got pretty similar to the national numbers. Well, then they were worried, all right, how's this gonna change as people get used to them? So they re did the study back in 2007 and the numbers were almost identical. So still, overall crashes down over 40, injury crashes down almost 70. I mean, that's pretty impressive from a, a safety perspective. This shows the intersection type, the conversion. The closest one to a roundabout is an always stop. So then I asked people, why don't we put always stops everywhere? Because they have a pretty significant capacity limitation, which is why we don't. We're making a trade-off by putting in a signal to improve capacity. But typically, when we put a signal in, the crash rate actually goes up. And this shows the conflict points. This is really focusing on the pedestrians. Think about that intersection now if you tried to cross it. If you're crossing 60 there on the northern side, you're crossing 60-something feet of pavement. With the roundabout, you're going to be crossing two lanes on the entry and only one lane on the exit, with cars either stopped or doing about 10 to 15 miles an hour much safer than crossing even at the signalized intersection. This is actually a, a Rochester area roundabout. This was our really first high-speed rural. People thought we shouldn't really have a roundabout on a rural high-speed roadway. It wouldn't match driver expectations. They just come up on this in the middle of nowhere and really not know what to do with it. And we built the roundabout. We actually had a two-way stop. We even put the flashers, the red and yellow flashers up, still had serious crashes, so we built the roundabout. And the crash study for this location, we had 13 crashes before the roundabout was built, 
Eight PDOs or property damage only, the fender benders, and five injuries. I've had zero once the roundabout was going in. I mean, they're, they're few and far between. We did have six property damage only, so about the same rate for the PDOs, but no injuries. And we do have crashes. This is actually from uh, Olean, which was pretty recent, a couple of months ago. I just stumbled across a crash thing, and it said, you know, at Friday at 1.20 in the afternoon, two-vehicle crash, but again, no injuries, which, you know, for a 79-year-old driver to be in a crash and not have an injury, that's, to me, pretty impressive. You know, if you slow the cars down to 15 or 20, our cars are very good at protecting our, our occupants. For pedestrians and bicyclists, we've had zero severe pedal bike accidents. This is actually a study that was done in 2005. And we had roughly 13 non-injury at that point. This is, uh, again, showing a delay. Now, whether or not you want to believe the simulation when I show it, it actually is the PM traffic. If we want to watch it for an hour and count the cars, I can guarantee you that's what's out there. can absolutely guarantee it. And you're going to make the point, well, it looks like there's not too many cars out there. It's just we're not stacking them up for a minute as they sit at a, a red light. Public involvement, public resistance is common. There's a shocker, right? You know, about a third of my job is trying to address the, the public involvement process. Before construction, national average is three to two against. Some areas it's higher, could be that today. You know, and some areas are starting to now say, all right, why don't we get one here, here, or here, which hopefully will happen next time I come back to this area. Education is crucial. You know, after construction, four to one in favor. So for the person that asked about how do people treat them you know, after it was built, please come see me. I can actually show you the studies on that. And visualizations and simulations are very helpful. All right, might as well get into the popular but unrealistic reasons why roundabouts shouldn't be built. Large trucks can't get through them. I'll show a video of a modular home. Actually, I'll kind of skip the video if people want to see it. I'll show a screen capture of it. Roundabouts can't be plowed. I think there's actually the plowing video over there. When I first heard that, it was from our internal maintenance guys. B being kind of sarcastic at the time, they're like, well, we can't build roundabouts because we can't plow them. I'm like, well, you better tell Europe that and Colorado and all these other states that have had them for 10 or 15 years because if they can't plow them, that's something they really ought to know. Obviously, that comment didn't go over very well, but you know, we can plow a, a roundabout. Roundabouts are failing in Massachusetts and New Jersey. I hear that all the time because they're border states. It's the, the rotaries or traffic circles that they're taking out. No one's removing roundabouts. They may work elsewhere, but not here. There's really not a, a way for me to address that one. But everyone thinks the roundabout may work somewhere else, but just not here at this location. Unsafe near schools. I know a concern is the school nearby and also the hospital coming and the high-speed roads. If people want, during the, the break or after the 5.30 presentation, I got a 12-minute video from Wisconsin where they put roundabouts in next to two schools. They wouldn't allow the kids to bike or walk to school until the roundabouts were put in. It's interviews, public works director, school principal, traffic and safety, the police, and they all love the roundabouts. And uh, may reduce severe accidents, but more fender benders. You know, I can be honest, you know, there's a couple roundabouts in New York State where we actually have the, the number of non-injury crashes go up, more fender benders. It's typically the full two lane versus two lane. That seems to be our issue. At this location, you don't have really two lane versus two lane. You got one approach with two lanes that go in. One lane's a right and through lane, the other is a left turn only. You have no two lane exits. It's more of a glorified single laner than a multi-lane roundabout. This is the uh, modular home. This is actually in Greenwich, New York. When we first proposed a roundabout there, everyone told us, well, it may work for 51 weeks out of the year, but when the county fair comes in, it's going to fail because we have police at the intersection and traffic backs up for over a mile. So the video actually it took, and I'll, I'll show it during the, the break if people want to see it. We went out Friday afternoon during the county fair, and we had a four-car queue, I think was our max, compared to a mile previous with the signal and police trying to override it. I'll actually show the video, about probably 15 seconds. And large trucks, this one kind of surprised us. We didn't know the Menden roundabout, that one I showed out in the Rochester area, had oversized overweight vehicles running down Route 65. 
I got a panic call one day saying I got a 140-something foot trailer getting ready to go through the roundabout. Is it going to work? I'm like, I don't know. Um, luckily, this one was designed a little bigger than it probably needed, and that actually vehicle did get through the roundabout, which I was a little nervous about. Um, I mentioned the truck apron. We typically have that four inches, a little four inch raised area to try to keep the vehicles from using it to go too fast, but it does allow the trucks that extra width that they need. And the plowing video, actually, I don't know if it's running on that laptop now or not, but it was earlier, and I can definitely show these videos between the presentations or after the 5.30. You know, we actually wanted a plowing video and no one had one, so my boss decided to run up to our Greenwich Roundabout, that's always our guinea pig for videos, and met our plow operator up there, and it's, you know, we'll be playing there and up here later if you want, and really had no problem with it whatsoever. It takes them, surprisingly, even with the wings out because the radius is so small, about eight laps to clear it. I mean, they're just, they get in the inside and just push it to the outside. It takes them about eight laps, but again, it takes all of a minute to do those eight laps. This is actually a quote from Greenwich Town Supervisor. You know, a lot of people were worried about that one and said, you know, it's the best thing that's happened here. Traffic now flows. You know, even during the county fair, it worked perfectly which everyone was convinced the roundabout was gonna fail as soon as the county fair came in. This is another one where a school issue came up. This is actually in Kinderhook, New York, and we actually interviewed the director of the bus transportation. They have 28 buses, I believe I heard 20 for the school here, so similar, and very pleased with the roundabout. No problems whatsoever are reported. Now, the roundabout actually works quite well. This person, they uh, commented on our Greenwich Roundabout. You know, they were a little worried about it. And they said, you know, not an expert on traffic. I think everyone's an expert on traffic, so we need to give them a set of keys in their hand. They were convinced it wasn't going to work out. At least now she described driving through the circle intersection as an awesome experience. But she still had to get a parking, parking, parking shot. I guess sometimes, not always, but sometimes, you just have to trust the opinions of the traffic expert. I can live with that. We're not always right but I think more often than not we are. But yeah, she had to get that little parting shot, which I, I kind of liked. Roundabouts can be great for business. Olean actually has roundabout. Anyone been through the Olean corridor? Olean, all right, thank you. Olean, yeah. All right, so beyond not knowing how to pronounce the Olean roundabouts, anyone drive through those? Okay, a few people. You're still here, it's a good thing. Uh, any opinions? Sure. I have a business called the Paper Factory. Called the, the Paper, paper Factory? Fact is a Paper Factory OEM. Okay. Good friends with them. He shared with me before I came to the meeting his experience with the roundabouts and what happened to his business. Okay. His business during construction was down just shy of 40%. Okay. It's been a year now since that's been completed. His business has not come back. He has sold two of his stores that are junction and just hanging on by his fingertips. People love going through town. They can get through town very quickly. They are not stopping because they don't want to have to enter the traffic again. So when you say business, I have an experience and that's, that's my point. It's not good. Good business. Well, maybe not for all, but overall, it's definitely better for most. Yeah. But, you know, there definitely could be certain cases where there's not. Sounds like that's one. I'd like to actually find out more on that, actually. I'll be happy to share with you. Okay, excellent. All right, so here's the intersection we're looking at today. This is actually coming uh, from the village. This is where we have the left turn only lane. The right lane goes right and through. The other three legs develop right turn only lanes, little slip lanes that don't go into the roundabout. So there's only one fourth of the circle that has two lanes in it. So I really don't like calling this a multi-lane roundabout. It's more of a glorified single laner than a multi-lane. You know, we have roundabouts where all four legs have two lanes and they all go through everywhere. And it definitely is a little bit more complex than, than this one. This is actually showing the right turn only sign so one lane comes up, the left lane goes through and left, flare to the right turn bay, 
turns right. This is actually, if people want to find a similar roundabout, I would look into this one. It's actually in East Greenbush, New York. Uh, State Route 4 at 151 called Cow's Corners. You know, you're going to come up on three of the legs. You're going to see a right turn lane develop. If you want to turn right, you get into that lane. If not, go into the roundabout. Pretty simple. Now leaving the village, you're going to have a left turn only lane. So you're going to come up. You want to turn left, get in the left turn only lane. Both of these lanes go into the roundabout. The outer lane can go right or go through. The inner lane goes left and left turn only. Again, pretty simple once you actually drive the thing. So this is actually the simulation. It is actually the PM peak volume. I built the simulation. I can actually fire up the program and show you the volume that are in there. And this is pretty much the middle of the PM peak hour. I have a couple different videos on some videos. The queue gets to about here on one leg and then this has nothing and then sometimes it flips as one leg gets a little busier than the other. I think the maximum queue I ever had was about to here on this leg. So it was about to here. I do have some of the buses coming in and out of the school. I think I put 20 in an hour, which again, we're worried about, you know, the buses at 2.30, I'm assuming, as compared to 5 o'clock when the regular traffic is the worst. But I can definitely build the, the model to show the 2.30 bus dismissal. I was kind of surprised to hear that they do actually just shut the intersection down and let the, the buses out. Really, the roundabout's not going to be any better or worse than the signal in that case. Now, the roundabout will recover quicker because you don't have to wait through a cycle to get your turn again. So if nothing else, that's going to be an improvement. It will recover quicker with the roundabout. If you notice in this video, we're actually having a little queue on the northbound move. Now it's about six, seven, eight cars, but once there's a little lag in traffic, either from a signal or something down here, those cars just roll in. So you're going to see every now and then a five or six car queue, and a couple seconds later, it's gone. I think I have 600 and something cars coming from the north, four or five from the south, and like three or 400 on the east and west leg. Now, the exact counts that I was given for the most recent traffic counts at this intersection. They're actually in the model. This actually runs for uh, about a minute. I'll just let people watch it. But this is the PM peak hour. So if we went out there today, we counted these cars and count the ones there now, you're going to see that they are pretty similar. The, the painted white areas are to give trucks the extra room so they don't have to you know, get too close to the cars, allow the trucks and cars to coexist. See this truck waiting to make the, the right turn. See a couple cars getting queued up here. Once a couple cars continue south, they allow this movement to go. So every time someone circulates, they're making a gap for the next leg downstream, which is kind of nice. And you actually watch a roundabout move and everyone's just rolling around through. Go out to 20 at 60 now, and sometimes you see two lanes. Think of all those lanes at that intersection. And if the north-south left turn only lanes are moving, you have two lanes moving at any point. That's it. So out of the 14 or so lanes, two are moving. Otherwise, it's a temporary parking lot when the right light's red. With the roundabout, everybody's moving. It's a beautiful thing. That is the PM peak. Here shows the, the school. I have 20 buses going in and out in the hour. So if we actually wanted to build the 230 model, if I could get the 230 volumes, I can have the buses all get dumped at once. I kind of jokingly said, well, if we continue the median right past the school, we can make the buses turn right, go to the roundabout, make a U-turn. Would probably be just as good as what they do now. Okay, that, that was my presentation. I don't know how you want to address questions. Well, I do have a minute. We can start on this side of the room. All right. And move to the right. Um, 
We have a stenographer here, so before you ask the question, I would just ask, number one, that you speak slowly and clearly, and that you start your question or your comment by giving your name. She may ask you to spell it. We, we do have signage, so if you don't need to spell it, we're going to need to ask you. So I'll start in the front corner here on the side. I don't want to disturb the question process, but I'm going to show the plowing video and the modular home video, but without sound while we're doing the questions. Yes, my name is Rusty Gross. Uh, you said that the roundabout you have planned is three and a half million. Is there a cost estimate on the other two options? There were cost estimates on all the options that were examined in the design report. Do you have those? Um, we have a copy of the design report. Here. Uh, we have a, you know, I, in fact, remember correctly, the, the, the alternative two was around 1.8 million, and uh, alternative three A was 3.1, and the three B is 3.4. So it's in the it's in the report. It's it's available online too. But you uh, yeah. yeah. my memory sounds a bit like those. Is there a microphone? We can yeah. hear yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Sir, do you have a yeah. While we're getting that straightened out, this is actually the, the modular home large video from Greenwich, New York. We just happened to catch this by accident that Friday when we were told the roundabout was likely going to fail. And there were roughly about a four car queue. Uh, that one I believe is 75 feet long. We design if it's on a designated truck route or typical design vehicles, an 80 foot long by 16 foot wide modular. That's the largest we permit. You've got 63 windmill things on that 130 foot piece. They right. Flow there. Now, let me say something about that. Those oversized loads have to get a special vehicle hauling permit to move through any intersection. So whether it's a roundabout or not, they're going to have to get, be routed a special way. Um, typically, the choke point for moving those vehicles is not going to be this roundabout. But my ma'am, ma'am, one person at a time, please. If, if they're behind that vehicle, it's not going to matter whether it's a roundabout or a signalized intersection. That vehicle's still going to have a hard time making a left turn there. Right, but my point I'm is. Saying sometimes, be clear here. If that roundabout is the same exact size as our roundabout, I don't know that that's true, and I'd like to know if that's true. But what I'm saying, and what I, as a, as a village resident, am concerned about, and my name is Melanie Mann, so for the record, um, I am concerned that emergency vehicles that are going through that roundabout get stuck behind something like that, and time is of the essence. That could be very, very upsetting to family members and people involved in that situation. Again, I'll, I'll say it again. Emergency vehicles will have no trouble negotiating the roundabout. If your concern is, is that they'll get caught behind an oversized load, that's going to happen whether there's a roundabout there or not. People pull over But people will be able, it'll be 15 seconds for that oversized load to get through the roundabout, and then they'll be able to get around. Can the audience also have a microphone by any chance? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to hand it to them. Robert Elias, uh, courtesy and speed has got a lot to do with this. And very seldom there's people that has courtesy going through them things. And another thing, you're showing all these roundabouts in good weather, summertime, it's altogether different in the wintertime. You won't see the roadside paintings or the numbers on the highway at all. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm uh, just going to show our, our plowing video. This is back when we still got snow in the Albany area, 2006 or so, I believe. My boss is not much of a movie director. He didn't turn the wipers off. He's also driving one-handed while videotaping in a compressed natural gas vehicle, but we won't tell anyone that. And roundabout's moving. There's about two feet of snow on the ground. And about two cars. There's no traffic. 
Uh, it's it's a definitely a little lower volume, but you don't have a lot of volume at this one either compared to some of our other roundabouts. All right, do we have anyone else here in the first row? Hi, my name is Doug Essek. I'm a resident and I'm also a village trustee. And uh, my name is Doug Essek. Um, I'm a resident of the village and I'm also a village trustee and I'm here to uh, be the uh, person to help uh, address uh, residents' concerns. One of my thoughts and questions was, have you uh, actually sat at that intersection and, and watched the traffic? I did for about 15 minutes while I was eating my McDonald's. Okay, so the videos that we see here and your uh, representation, I'm not really sure. I don't know if it's an average number of cars over an hour or a period of time, but uh, during certain periods of time, like rush hour, it doesn't seem to be very representative of the... The video of that simulation for that site was the exact PM peak. Okay. All right. I have a lot more, but I'll speak to you afterwards. And my name is Julie Essek, and I'm uh, concerned in a couple different areas. First of all, the roundabout, I've heard numerous upon numerous people saying they will avoid this roundabout. The problem with that, the avoidance of a roundabout, is that they start getting on ancillary roads that are not made for the traffic that the people that are going to be traveling in the future because they do not want to go around the roundabout. They are afraid. I have a 90-year-old father. He is not going to use that to go to the new Wendy's. He is using the intersection today. He will not use that. I know a lot of people my age that say they do not want to use it. My concern is, have you studied the volume traffic? I know you're saying all these accidents are down. I probably believe that because the traffic is probably down. The traffic before the roundabout might be eight million a year, which is what we have. The traffic eight after this roundabout is probably gonna be about six because there's a number of people that will avoid this. Now, you take the ancillary road, such as Central Avenue leading to, McCall or leading to Millard Fillmore. You take McAllister, you, you take Lakeview Road. Those roads are not meant for the traffic that they are going to see because I am not probably going to use a roundabout that I've never been trained to use. They do not teach us in children's driver's ed. My child just took driver's ed. It is not taught. It is not comfortable, and we've made it not comfortable. Therefore, we're going to see avoidance. I am concerned about those areas that we are going to travel on and that there are going to be accidents on those areas not meant for that traffic. And I'm concerned about my daughter that's 17, myself that's 50, my father that's 90. It is not an age thing, it is a training thing. Well, actually, they should have covered that in the defensive driving. It's actually in the New York State DMV manual now also. I was driving last summer. I took it in Jamestown. Well, then covered. that's a problem with the course then. Because I know in the Albany area, it's being covered. You can talk about it. You could see it on the screen. That is not being covered. I'm not comfortable driving that. And, and I'm not afraid to say I'm, I'm uncomfortable. All right, ma'am. We've, we've heard your comment. We'll, you. we'll give that consideration. Well, well, Craig, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, like Howard pointed out, this is not going to be the first roundabout in the area. There are 24 of them. So we know there are other areas where traffic volume, uh, you know, there was a, we, we had traffic counts before and after. Uh, one example that comes to mind is Harlem Road, where traffic volume is higher than here. There is a lot more commercial development along the roadway. And the traffic volume did not drop after the roundabouts were built and the number of accidents went down. So we have examples like that. And if you're saying there are examples where traffic volume went down after the roundabout was built, I would like to know where they are. No, I'm suggesting that no, I know I'm not going to use yeah. it. So my, my car isn't going through there anymore. But, but I live there. I live in Amherst. And on Harlem Road, there are roundabouts. And uh, traffic volume did go down. And you have way more commercial development out there, gas stations, uh, you know, fast food restaurants, retail stores. Uh, they're all there, on, I mean, and uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can go there and look at it yourself. So, you know, we have examples like that, and we were. You know, it, it's not that we, if we build roundabouts in Western New York, it's only for people who live here. What do you mean? We all live here. Craig lives here. I live here. Mark lives here. Jennifer lives here. We drive the same road, same roundabouts. Our family does too. My wife, my 19-year-old son. I would not make a facility dangerous for them 
why, why would you think that we would have such a grudge against the public? That, uh, you know, I mean, uh, why would I try to punish my 19-year-old son? Actually, roundabouts are endorsed by the AARP as well as one of the best ways to address our growing elderly driving population. Uh, Gary Tobiko, village resident, business owner in Dunkirk. There's two, uh, there's two things that people are talking about in this community that they, they absolutely cannot believe is happening. Number one is the hospital. Number two is the roundabout. You will be hard pressed to find anybody in this community that really wants this roundabout. On the throughway going 65, you're being passed going 70. On Route 60, the speed limit is 45. And you can be going 48 and probably not get a ticket, although you could, you probably wouldn't get a ticket at 50. So why, if the concern is with accidents and fatalities, which by the way I understand there's only been one fatality, not that that's good, we don't want fatalities. Why wouldn't you want to reduce the speed limit to about 30, maybe 35, you did it by the school here, why wouldn't you want to try that first? Something that we would probably most all be in agreement with and slow the traffic down so that the people coming out of these sides, the restaurants, the businesses, are not gonna collide with a car going 48 or 50. And I have not heard an answer to why you wouldn't wanna try that first and rather spend $3.5 million to put a roundabout in. That makes no sense at all to any of us. My name is Bruce Malton, uh, resident and owner of the business right by the round, proposed roundabout. What Gary said, I, I spoke to several of you on the phone. Uh, why not try some of these other avenues first and at far less money? And the response was, it's a Band-Aid, is what I was told. Otherwise, reducing speed, obviously, everybody mentions putting lights, they're talking about the, the, the troubles with trucks coming too quickly to the intersection, uh, putting some lights ahead, letting them know the lights are gonna change so they know to slow down, they can't make, make the lights. And there's several things that we've all spoke about. Why not, if you talk about education, you're gonna teach people how to use these roundabouts. Why not use that same educational practice to teach them not to make left turns incorrectly or left turns, period. Why not make it illegal to make a left-hand turn out of my one driveway, or Country Fair, or Tim Hortons, Tuscany, McDonald's, Rite Aid, b and Tire, all these places. And they said to me, the reason you can't do that is because who's gonna enforce it? And to me, is that something that should be able to be done? If it's left-hand turns we're trying to avoid, we should do it. And something else mentioned earlier also, is that the trucks can't make a U-turn if we put just medians in. I've never seen a truck make a U-turn on Route 60, 20 to turn around. They go to a business, they turn around, they go back. So I'm not sure I understand that comment, and maybe you could elaborate what you meant by that, because I don't ever remember seeing a truck not be able to make a U-turn. They don't do that. Uh, I can answer that question. Let's say a truck comes down on Route 60 and turns into McDonald's and wants to come out and make a left turn and go back to six, uh, towards through it. They can do it now. But if you put in a raised median, how would it come out? So you're saying the, the businesses at the corners. Wait, can you take my phone please? Okay. So you're saying the businesses like mine, if, if a tractor trailer comes to my business, and can't make a left-hand turn, okay? Is that what you're saying? It's just the businesses on those corners you're concerned with those tractor trailers not being able to make lefts. No, what I'm talking about is the reason why we are installing the roundabout is because a tractor trailer coming out of the throughway wants to use these businesses, cannot cross over, because right now there is no physical obstructions. You have a center turn lane, which is flush with the rest of the pavement. It can go over it. Once you put in a raised median, you're providing a vertical barrier for a truck to be able to cross to the other side. Oh, okay. 
You know, you can remedy that with a channel at the entry there, Sanjay. Oh, we're going this way and then we'll be... Well, I know, but he, he asked a question that wasn't answered. I happen to know the answer. You could put a channel at the driveway, Sanjay. So it would force the outgoing ve vehicle to go right. Well, know? if we put it at, we do that at every driveway, that we don't even need a raised median. I'm sorry, what did you say? If we put in, a, if we put an opening at every driveway, then why put in the raised median? Exactly. Exactly. That'd we be don't your really, answer. It'd well, be a lot then, cheaper too. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, I apologize. Next. Thank you. Anyone in the second row? Row three. Hi, my name is Pat Schwartrager. Um, I would like to ask all you gentlemen and the state DOT, a lot of the people do not want the roundabout. And uh, I can't understand why you can't go along with the request of most of the people in the area to lower the speed limit before you do anything like this. At least give it a year's try to lowering the speed limit. And I think that would make everybody a lot happier knowing that you at least tried it before you, before you jammed us down our throats. We live here, we would have to put up with it. You don't live here, you wouldn't have to put up with it. So I think a lot of people here would like to have you please, at least for one year, lower the speed limit throughout that whole area and see how it comes out accident-wise. That's my suggestion. I think that's a suggestion of about 90% of the people that you would ask. Try lowering the speed limit before you do this. Okay. Anyone else in the third row? Uh, what happens when there's an accident in that roundabout? Yes, yeah, yeah, start with your name. Joe Walzak. What happens when, like you said, there's only minor fender benders? But that blocks the whole roundabout then. What happens to the traffic then? What the cops are there to the scene and everything else? In a few seconds, I'll actually find a video of one that came right up on us. It definitely is not a great condition to be in, but you got 5,000 roundabouts around the country that are working. But okay, I and I know the one in the village of Hamburg, um, that one quite often has people just going straight through because they don't know what a roundabout is. Okay, which one you, I'll find that video showing the one roundabout crash in all All right. Is, uh, Great for roundabouts, but here's what happens when you have an independent driver coming up on a roundabout. We notice a driver from the northwest. <laughs> These aren't drugs. <laughs> they don't have any traffic. Where are the cars? They don't have any semis and all that other stuff. Everyone will be asking where all the cars are. Actually, there have been studies about the quick concern was people diverting to other streets. We have not seen that in any of our roundabouts, even though we're told for every one of them. Howard, who's the mic here? If you, Boorsville, New York, if you want to probably do a Google search, it'll come up. I actually had to spend three hours with a Breakfast with Your Neighbors television show being told that the roundabout was the worst thing we could do to the town of Boorsville. The new grocery store, no one would go to it. The kids couldn't drive it. The senior citizens couldn't drive it. It would just kill the town. And surprisingly enough, six months later, Everybody loves it. Even that one person was a retired superintendent of public works when asked six months later at a Stewart's parking lot what they thought of the roundabout. All they could say was the craftsmanship was nice and it seemed to work well. All these doomsday scenarios people think are going to happen all over the place and rarely do we have any kind of issues like what people perceive are going to occur before the roundabout's actually built. Think about the other 24 locations in Buffalo area. Everybody had those same concerns. And you know, I want to find Oleon. I want to find out you know about the business in Oleon, why they're having an issue. But uh, really, they were they're all working quite well. I 
I was going to say, you're trying to convince us about the roundabout, how great they are. Why can't we convince you to lower the speed limit for a year? <laughs> I, I do have to point out that we have national studies showing if we drop the speed limit by 10 miles an hour, we get about a one or two mile an hour actually decrease unless police are there 24-7. No way. Do it for a year. And you spoke about a fatality. There was no fatality. Excuse me. Sorry. Richard Ellis, Porter Road, Fredonia. You spoke about a fatality. We've had no fatality at that intersection. You, someone brought that up before. It was a heart attack. A driver had a heart attack. Absolutely. Fatal heart attack at that intersection. So there was no actual fatality from any car accident. So that how that ever got on the record, I don't know. But that's not wrong. Because another thing is true. We do not. We have expressed this since December of 2016. We do not need this roundabout. We don't want it, we want speed reduction. And you talk about deaths, the rest of Route 60, if you notice in our article, it was written by the, well, it was backed up by the county sheriff, there have been 82 deaths on that highway, making it the most dangerous county highway in Stalker County. And, but nothing's being done by us. But finally, I noticed another article, in March article, that they are going to do some redesign. But, so thank you very much, but I appreciate it. Please, give us another time on the speed and get rid of this round of should be enough width probably on both sides depending on the design but I've had videos of EMS vehicles running in through the outdoor if that's what I want to describe going in the opposite way right I, mean, I have videos of that occurring I believe that was a three-year study. Most of our traffic safety studies. Are you talking about the accident study and the, the actual design report? Yeah, on the actual video that was shown. What about on the accident? Is that just me? Is that it? Are you talking about the the uh, 102 accidents that I mentioned earlier? That was a three-year study. Yeah. Three years. Yeah, three. Years, like Howard said, three years is our statute. Everything. It includes all accidents. Any accident for which a law enforcement officer fills out MV-104 form. How is, it, is that going down to uh, weather too? Absolutely. It, it's broken down by time of day, weather condition, dark, uh, icy condition, wet condition, all of those things. Uh, it, it, a number of vehicles involved, signal vehicle, you run off the road type. And uh, it, it's a fairly, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a pretty good investigation that's done. It, I, I, don't, I don't want to spend more time in explaining that because they're like, they're, it's a 45 page manual uh, on going through all those steps. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the next row here.
Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Marty Sandy. First of all, I want to compliment uh, uh, you folks from DOT for these great videos and simulations. Uh, uh, I noticed in watching it that uh, all the cars are going in the same direction. Uh, they seem to be slowing down, um, so there's no head-to-head. And they seem to, to, to have a sense of when to yield and when to move forward. Um, a problem with what we have now, a couple problems. First of all, there's a lot of people that rush the lights. People seem to be impatient. They come to a light and they're waiting in line and they see it's been green for a while. They finally get up there and they rush the light and they're in that intersection longer past when they should be. And there's also people that can see the, the red light in the other direction, and they proceed into the intersection too quickly. And then you have people turning, that are stuck out there in the intersection. They can't see the light because they're underneath it. And the other cars are trying to move through, and uh, they create a jam. Now, the other point I wanted to make was um, the peak hours. I don't know how many hours this would be a day, two or three or four, but what about the rest of the day when we have to queue up for the red light and wait? And that really irritates people. It's nice to be able to drive right through this intersection. Thank you. I share your opinion. Next bill. Uh, my name is Andy Goodell. Uh, my concern is on the lengths of the rise medians that go in all directions from the roundabout. For example, let's say you're heading east on Route 20 and you want to go to McDonald's. How do you get there? You have to go around 100 and, or 360 degrees and come back? Or if you're heading north? Of course, everyone in this room knows I live on Happy Meals, and maybe I should have one now, but if you're heading north, and it didn't occur to you that you needed a Happy Meal until you went through the roundabout, is your only option then to do a U-turn? And so my question really relates to what can we do with this roundabout to make it easier for people who are traveling to visit the country fair, or I think it's Wendy's, or McDonald's or the neighboring businesses because ultimately the purpose of our transportation system is help people get to where they want to go not pass by where they want to go safely I mean safety is very important of course but can you address are there things that we can do to make it easier for people to actually use businesses that are at that corner Up on the screen is the, the layout. So which movements are you worried about again? So let's say you're heading, uh, you're heading east on 20, that's from okay. the left to the right, and you want to go to McDonald's. You have to do 360 degrees in order to go to McDonald's? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, okay, now let's say, you're, yeah. Wait, now let's say you're heading north, and you uh, don't realize you need a McDonald's until after you go through the roundabout. Your only option is to do a U-turn. So if you've passed here and then you realize you want you get the, the happy meal fix. <laughs> right. Then you gotta find a driveway to turn around in. Yeah. So my question is can we shorten the medians or provide other ways so that people who want to go to those businesses can actually go to them without going around in circles? Thanks. Well I, I believe some of the background of this project was there were a lot of access related crashes. I mean access management, the worst movement we allow in the roadway is the permitted left, which is what a lot of the roundabouts are trying to prevent or definitely reduce. Now over two half of the crashes were access management related crashes. All right, here in the next row, anyone would like to make a comment? That's if you're the driver that gets the Happy Meal munchie and you have to do it. Okay. 
My name is Ruth Ekstrom. I was one of the alternatives that was looked at, an alternative number four, where you took the existing lanes that you had, reduced them, and made an access road and made all turns to the right. Sonny, can you, did you hear what she asked? Yeah, no, that's what the roundabout is. It's all right turns. No, access roads that run parallel to Route 60 and Route 20. So as a person travels, there are no left turns. They're all right turns into an area like they are in the Midwest. And access points are all at traffic lights or stop signs so that everyone is going in and out of the same place, not at every driveway. I, I don't think our design report actually looks at that concept, but to, to produce what you're saying, we would have to buy quite an extensive amount of right of way. Well, but you have to provide separation between the through lane, if you will, and the access lane. It, it takes up more room than you think. And in this case, we would be buying strip right away up and down, both Route 20 and Route 60, which is going to have a very significant effect on all those businesses. Anyone here in the back row? All right. In, on the right in the first row, anyone who'd like to make a comment? Any, anyone here in front? My name, my name is Wade B. Levan. I'm a resident in Dunkirk, New York, and I work in Fredonia. I have a couple points I'd like to make, three of them actually. One is we are, uh, we deal with the state DOT quite a bit, uh, our communication company. We are doing a broadband program where we're deploying uh, 600 poles, and our pole barn is due, I'm trying to get uh, east of the intersection. And um, so we're gonna be adding a lot of expense because we have, obviously, it's a, a, a setting trailer pulling a uh, telephone pole. So with this turnabout, it's going to add time to repair for communications, 911, et cetera. That's one concern, obviously. The second concern um, I have is it, I'm an I'm observer more so than anything else, and I'm observing the conversations that are taking place in the predisposition of those who are answering, and it, the comments of ma being made of this is what we're doing, we're putting this in, We've already come to that conclusion. You've, ha you've talked about a fatality that didn't occur. Uh, you've talked about accidents. Speaking of accidents, uh, I believe the study uh, statistically shows that sideswipes, uh, vehicles being sideswiped, increase in roundabouts, which is going to impact everybody's insurance in this room and their insurance rates are gonna go up. The state's spending $3.5 million on something, and the community members in the audience is telling you they don't want it. My point being, as a servant of the state, don't you think that some of the other suggestions may be under advisement you also cha made changes in DOT to Route 60 from a four lane to a three lane. The reason that occurred was a state trooper who was in head of the investigation sideswiped another, uh, a daughter of another trooper. It immediately changed that intersection from a four lane to a three lane within a year. Knee jerk reaction is not necessarily the best. That's my point. And I'll turn it over to somebody else.
Here in the first row. Second row. Hello, my name is Alan Bozer. I'm an attorney with Phillips Lytle. Uh, we represent the owner of the McDonald's uh, that is shown to the left of the roundabout. I've also used this intersection at least a thousand times in my life. I'm one of the attorneys who represented the McDonald's owner. We started a lawsuit, it was about a year ago, when DOT first came out with the plan for the roundabout. Uh, we were successful in having DOT go back to the drawing board and they've come forward again. Now the whole basis for this project, according to the DOT, is a high accident rate in the project area. I don't think anybody in, in this room or anywhere else would, would want to argue with, with um, changes that would reduce the accident rate and making improvements to resolve that issue makes perfect sense. However, the Department of Transportation seems to have latched onto this roundabout with raised medians concept without any real consideration of less disruptive, less costly options, and without serious consideration of the problems this project will create for the community. As you look up here, you will see the McDonald owner's concern with the medians that extend so far to the north on Route 60 from the roundabout and all the way down to the, to the west on Route 20 so that anyone who wants to make that left turn coming west on Route 20 has to go all the way around the roundabout and come back which I think uh, increases the, the potential for problems. And anybody on Route 60 who wants to get to the McDonald's and doesn't understand all of the intricacies here has to go down and, as the gentleman said, find a, a driveway to, uh, to, to turn into and then come back again. Now, compare that with the, the treatment of Wendy's. Now, this is not McDonald's versus Wendy's. This is business owner trying to have a fair shake of things. With Wendy's, if you come up to the roundabout from Fredonia, you turn right and you'll see in the lower portion, there's an immediate opportunity for a left-hand turn into Wendy's. If, on the other hand, you're coming up from Route 60 from Jamestown to turn left into McDonald's, that's not possible. That, that's uh, unequal treatment and reflects, we believe, an improper consideration of what's going on. The Department of Transportation, we believe, has mishandled this from day one and continues to do so. Uh, our client at McDonald's made an initial outreach to Department of Transportation to discuss this. Uh, we, weren't, uh, we weren't given that opportunity. It's because of that we filed a lawsuit last year and, and we believe succeeded. So here we are again a year later. Uh, we obtained the rescission of approvals at that time now the reissuance of this report without any real engagement again with the community. Uh, no opportunity for us at McDonald's to talk with the Department of Transportation leads to a, a, no real serious attempt to address our concerns and the concerns that are being addressed here by the community. Uh, the new report clearly reads like you started with an answer and then worked backwards to try and show that the answer was correct. I think that's called inductive logic, I'm not sure. Other problems here uh, 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 include the no real engagement of the affected community. While the report claims to have engaged the public and the community, there hasn't been any discussion over the past year, and the Department of Transportation has simply ignored the concerns that we raised. McDonald's had to sue to stop the project last year, like I said it, like, like I mentioned, uh, and again, we reached out and have not had any contact from the Department of Transportation and here we are a year later. Now there's a state environmental quality review analysis that's called CECRA, you may have heard of it. It remains highly flawed with the current presentation. Uh, in particular, the impacts to business. There's no real analysis. In the, in the document that we've seen, uh, there is reliance on 20-year-old reports, not real studies, uh, concerning the effect that this will have on the businesses in this area, the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the Rite Aid, the Country Fair. Uh, those are 20-year-old reports based upon a 7% return rate when surveys were sent out. That is not indicative of what really happened in these other areas that are the subject of the, of the study. 
Uh, it also cites one study from Utah which involved high growth communities and circumstances that don't closely resemble what we're dealing with here. Another item we, we will bring to the attention of those assembled is the reduction in pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, acknowledgments. The report acknowledges, for example, that Fredonia High School and the elementary school are adjacent to the project area, as are the many fast food restaurants, but does not provide the type of analysis about, about how all of those kids are going to safely traverse the new mega roundabout, which will have in excess of 40,000 vehicles per day, many of which are trucks, as opposed to the red light situation that currently, uh, that currently governs the area. Also, the accident analysis shows bicycles have been involved in accidents, yet the design does relatively nothing to address bicycle safety. There's a, also a very cursory uh, discussion of landscaping and environmental enhancement. Uh, for example, it says where space allows trees may be, uh, there may be opportunities to plant trees. Well, now is the time really to come forward with certainty uh, in this study. There may be further landscape enhancement opportunities that is said, again, now is the time to come forward. Will there or won't there be these improvements? There are other issues which have no meaningful environmental analysis attached in the report uh, that really need to go back to the drawing table. I won't go through all of the details here. They will be the subject of our submissions. Uh, I would say that the Department of Transportation really needs to listen to the community, needs to work with the community and the affected businesses to develop a solution that makes sense for everybody. I will note that uh, we had the lawsuit last year that uh, resulted in going back to the drawing board. I will also note that up in Buffalo, we have the Route 198 Skajakut Expressway, where there was major community opposition. The Department of Transportation took those plans off, off of the table and will now be starting all over again. So community activ activism, community getting involved really does work. Uh, I applaud those of the community have come out to express their interests. This is how democracy works. Uh, and there are many interests at work, not only commercial, but also the public. We will, of course, be submitting our formal written comments. Uh, and we appreciate the time of the Department of Transportation to listen to us. I'll, I'll hand the microphone down. Hello, um, I'm Chris Sargent. I work for uh, T.Y. Lynn. We're consulting engineers. We've been retained. We've done many jobs for McDonald's. Um, not to repeat much of what's already been said, but some of our concerns basically stem from the all or nothing approach that, has, that seems to have taken place here, whether it might be a better idea to, as many people have said, explore a speed limit reduction first or roundabouts themselves have certain safety benefits, do you just try a roundabout? And if that doesn't solve the problem, come back in with the medians. Um, there, there are also some inconsistencies, such as uh, the Wendy's driveway, as was mentioned, whereas a left turn channelized split into McDonald's heading northbound on Route 60, there's plenty of room. It's far enough downstream to avoid stacking into the roundabout. Um, there, are, there, there has been no accident history to speak of specific to McDonald's. Um, I, th I think that's just about it. It's just, as I, as I said, our, our complaints are mostly the all or nothing approach and then just inconsistency between the specific drivers, basically from an engineering standpoint. And that's, I'm just going to pass down to uh, the next uh, representative here. Uh, final comment. Adam Walters, also with Philip Seidel. Um, and I should point out the owner of McDonald's is here tonight uh, because he, he, as are many of the other affected businesses, are extremely concerned, as is the community at large. Um, I, I guess final comment, we would just encourage DOT to really have some meaningful engagement. And I, I know there's a process and you have a meeting and people come out and there's a uh, court reporter and uh, statements are taken down and you'll take it back and eventually you'll either respond or you can ignore them. But 
real community engagement involves sitting down, trying to analyze what are the issues, what are the challenges, and how can we come up with mutually agreeable solutions that make sense for everybody. And I would just throw out that uh, this project is not quite there yet. Uh, we remain welcome and open to the idea of working with the OT and the community to try and resolve these and address the traffic accident issues, reduce the rates, as Alan said, that makes all the sense in the world, but let's work on it together. Thank you. Uh, to the town people, hi. My name is Rico. I am the owner of the McDonald's. I apologize for the time that we maybe have taken up this evening. I truly feel that there is a tremendous injustice here. I will speak openly because I saw the original blueprints. The median shot in every which way. Okay, that sounds fair to me. Then in time, this median started to become reeled back. And at that moment in time, the DOT, as an opinion, elected to pick winners and losers. That's when I took a personal action in this. So personally speaking, I appreciate all those here that patronize our establishments, and that's all the establishments. And I hope that we can resolve this amicably. And from the judge's order, the judge's order was to come up with solutions with us collaboratively, and it never happened. We didn't hear from the DOT, and it's been almost a year. Just let the people know. We can make a difference, and we need to be solidified in our endeavors, and thank you. I'm Miles Callen. And I'm a resident of Fredonia and a student of the Central School. I was wondering, um, could you pull up the map, please? Sure. Thanks. Just switch that. This is a project in Colorado. Um, Pretty commercial with four roundabouts. I was hoping you could pull up the map yep, um, of Fredonia. Yeah, I'm getting there. So where the stripe center sections are at the corners, I was thinking that there we could put a place where emergency vehicles such as police cars and hospital cars could only go through. So like if a police car was trying to catch someone that was driving faster than the speed limit down at the bottom road, they could use the striped, they could use the striped corners to get to the other side of the road. That's all. Again, and actually the center board area, I don't know what the actual dimension is, but it's probably six or eight feet so in that center paved lane between the two through lanes. It's wide enough for another vehicle to truly need it. Thank you. Uh, Keith Callen, a resident and father of two students at the Fredonia Central School there. Um, I also have concern not only about business access, which is very important, but also about uh, using this opportunity to afford safer um, access to the Central School's lot. Uh, there's it, the use of channeled turn lanes seems to be the low-hanging fruit when we get into raised medians. Now, I'm not convinced that this is the best first option, but if it shows that it is a good option and the safest option, which of course is paramount, I think we should use that opportunity because it is very close to make sure that those who need to take a left-hand turn, for example, buses or uh, parents picking up their students, for example, uh, have that safe lane to do that. 
Um, it, it just seems silly not to address that issue. It'll help facilitate access to all the businesses and it'll help reduce accidents um, at our school, which I, th I think is, is pretty important. That would be right there, correct. So you're going to have the, the center turn lane. Right. Um, the center turn lane is not effective. Anybody who, who drives there, and uh, bus drivers have, have mentioned this a lot, it, it, you have people accessing business there, coming eastbound on 20. And that, because of the tightness of the situation, that impedes, uh, I mean, this happens on Vineyard Drive too, but that's a, a completely different issue. But you have somebody wanting to turn left in the westbound. Northern. I'm just Northern. talking about the, the west part of this intersection on 20. Okay. In front of the uh, Central School and, uh, and the Grocery Mart there. You have people who are simultaneously trying to make those left turns from opposite venues. Now, one possible benefit of the roundabout is to obviate that kind of interaction, to allow for access, you know, westbound access on 20 to the Fredonia Central School, and give opportunity for eastbound access to use the roundabout and enter those businesses safely. In addition, that kind of channel traffic can facilitate access, equal access, for all the businesses in that area. The other point that I see in this design, which causes me some concern, is that we're taking, in many cases, two lanes and pinching them into one. And I, I see potential for, for, well, I see potential for accident here. So, and this is mostly on the north side of 60. The south side of, uh, southbound 60, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in your plan, but the northbound of 60 seems to, to uh, need some revision. And having an opportunity where we can talk to representatives from the DOT in a public forum, perhaps even having your name and email would be a good thing, um, to give feedback and make this public through the village office might be something worth considering. Thank you. My name is Al Pecos. I hope I'm talking loud enough. Uh, everything, looks, everything looks good from a helicopter view. However, uh, when things come down to reality, I'm glad we're having this meeting, but I think this should be just the first step. All the businesses and all the people who are uh, there should be contacted and have their say so that uh, this, uh, so that what's going on with the public will be something that uh, is good for the community and the community will go along with it. So this is a good first step. Thank you. Anyone else in this row? Next row. All the way here to the back row, in the back. I actually just have a couple of quick questions. First, for what Al just said about. Sir, you got to see your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan Siskar. I'm a village resident and going to be directly affected by this roundabout. My business is located um, at that intersection as well. I kind of agree with what Al just said. You never contacted myself, McDonald's, the Rite Aid, any of it, anybody else. I think open communication should be something that should be said. You should be more people friendly, as it were. My other question is, how much is it going to cost to maintain this? Once you install it, these raised mediums that you say we can drive over, is that correct? Where? The raised mediums that go up and down these. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Yes. 
it's not advisable we drive over them. They're made of concrete. They will be affected by our snow plows and our salt. They will deteriorate. Is that correct? Eventually, yes. No different than any other in the state. But we don't have that issue right now with our four-way intersection. Well, we still have to maintain all the pavement and all the curb. But we're going to have more pavement to maintain. Is that correct? It, it, it's what I'm actually getting at. Is it not going to cost us three point whatever million dollars to install this, but isn't it going to cost us more money to keep it up? No. Well, you'll see a signal cost between three and five thousand a year. That's long. Yeah, I mean, it's going to cost something to maintain the, the hard surface of the pavement and the medians. Um, but. Whether, like Howard said, if we put a signalized intersection in there, then we're going to have maintenance costs for a signal. I mean, we're going to have to pay for electricity every month. The lights, the lights burn out. There's going to be a, a cost to maintain either way. It's not significantly different. It's not significantly different. But when we need to get snow out of this thing, I know you guys know how. I'm not saying you're ignorant. Trust me. But isn't it? more cost effective for us to maintain a four-way intersection with snow removal than it is a roundabout. I really don't think the cost is any different between the four-way or the, the roundabout. Pretty much with the roundabout, we can show the plowing video. There's a the person come in, start on the truck and push it to the outside. So they're going to do it quite a few laps, but it takes only about a minute as compared to the now, one of my other questions would be, of course, because I'm going to be affected by this, well, are they going to do this construction during the day, or is it going to happen at night? Our current plan is that um, construction will start and it will, it will go continuously. We are not proposing uh, nighttime only, only work here. Um, that's something we can consider, but at this point, that's not what we're proposing. I'm just saying to lessen the impact of people, this, obviously most of this area, area gets quiet after, say, 7, 8 o'clock at night. It would be better for us as residents who need to travel to where, wherever, the Walmarts, the throughway, wherever we need to go, to go through an intersection with that doesn't have a lot of construction equipment. Right. Well, um, you can look at that. You can, we do sometimes use nighttime only um, construction, but typically that extends the, the length of time that construction is actually underway quite significantly. So you say when you start construction, you're 24 hours a day? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if we go to nighttime only um, construction, maybe that, that's, you're talking maybe eight hours a day, whereas during peak construction season, our contractors often work 14 to 16 hours a day. Anybody? Hold on. You need to state your name again. <laughs> Joe Walzak. Has anybody thought after I seen you put up that Utah one with the four roundabouts, it's got what the one lady was talking about, access lanes. So that you pull in not every business has access. Okay, one second. I actually got that PowerPoint. Let me start that back up. Just give me a second. So the project you're referring to is actually Golden, Colorado. Um, and it was uh, pretty wide, just open access, six, seven, eight lanes wide. Yeah. No, that ain't So it. that's what they had. Okay. And here's yes. what they went to. See, I, you can't pull in all, all over every business. You got to pull in and you get two businesses or three and then pull out. Right. Why can't we 
have something like that, like that, instead of you know, jamming everything. If you go back there in probably a year or two, you're going to see most of those now closed. That was a concession they made in Golden, Colorado to the business owners, and they're still having more cracks than they want from an access man perspective. A lot of those are now going to be closed. All right, is there anyone else who'd like a chance to? Talk to the business owners all in that corner right, right here. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment for the record? Uh, Marty Sandin, go back to the scene of the intersection. The one here. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was not here at the beginning, and maybe you've already discussed this, but uh, I think it's important to point out all the additional sidewalks that were added. Presently, sidewalks end at the entrance to the school. There is no sidewalk beyond, on the other side, on the north side, there is no sidewalk beyond Tuscany. And if you notice, the sidewalk wraps around McDonald's and heads all the way up to Tim Hortons. On the other side, we have a sidewalk going down to, I'm not sure how far, on the east side of uh, 60. And on Route 20, we have a sidewalk going beyond uh, Wendy's. And on the other side, I think probably as far as the mobile home park. There are a number of children that live in the mobile home park. Those children should be able to cross this busy intersection. They already are much to the chagrin of their parents, their helicopter parents that drive them everywhere. But in spite of that, they are going to these stores. They're going to McDonald's, they're going to the, the Quick Fill, to Wendy's, to Denny's, down to Walmart. And you see, you have sidewalks, you have crosswalks. Um, I'd like you to talk about those. Thank you. Well, all I can say is we've uh, tried to add pedestrian accommodations as best we can into the project. Um, and this is the, the scheme that we came up with. And as you said, it's added quite a few uh, sidewalks and crossings at the roundabout. Now, we originally were going to start our presentation at 5.30, but a lot of people were here early, so we started it at 4.30. If there's no other comments now, I'm going to ask uh, Sanjay Singh to to, to redo his formal part of the presentation starting in about five minutes, and then we will let Howard redo his formal part of the presentation. Oh, hold on, uh, just a second. If you let us get through it, it will take about uh, 45 minutes to get through that. If anyone has any questions at the end of that, we'd be, we'd be happy to uh, answer them at that time. Um, I'm Mary Reese. I'm a, a resident of Dunkirk. Just have a question. If any of your simulations show um, vehicles trying to enter or exit the businesses at the roundabout, because I think that's the, one of the uh, issues of greatest concern is the access to and from those. And I look at it and I get confused. I can't figure out how the traffic will move in and out of those businesses easily. Before uh, Sunny goes up, I've got to show just a couple minutes of a video.
you know, they actually asked some of the business owners, residents, what they... Uh, Howard, why don't we hold that till the end? We'll do our presentation okay. again, and then if anyone wants to see that, we'll show it at the end. something in. I mean, you heard a lot of comments after the last presentation of concerns and problems and different things that people had issues with. If this isn't a, uh, if all those issues weren't, uh, you know, enough to say that this was a bad thing for us, what is a bad fit for a roundabout? Or is a roundabout the ultimate fix-all for everything? I'm about as roundabout biased as anyone could be, and I turned down the Roundabouts do it right away. Typically, is what stops roundabout. But we're able to fit this within the existing right. Away. Typically, you know, the intersection is tight, the building right the corners. We just don't have the space. That's not a problem. So right away is down. Next is volumes. The volumes here are high enough that we have to add some turn lanes, but we don't even need a two-lane roundabout, which you know it's been touted as a two-lane roundabout. This is really a glorified single laner with one left turn only lane added to it. Closer to single lane. If you go into our highway design manual, that's pretty much our design Bible, we do give a few reasons why roundabouts may be good. One, if it's in a coordinated network, depending on how the coordination is set up, the roundabout may not provide the same kind of capacity as a well working coordinated system. If the grades are steep, we don't have that here. I mentioned the right way in the volume. Also, if it's uh, Opticon, overridden for EMS. Sometimes that could be a concern. Now, most people from any ES perspective, once they actually look at the roundabout, dealt with it, and there's actually reports, really it's, it's, it's a non issue. So if there's nothing in our typical checklist of what makes a, a site a bad site existing here. Yes, you have business access. You know, that seems to be the, the most significant hurdle to overcome. But the roundabout does provide access. It may not give you less in the most immediate, but the worst movement we allow on our roadway. Is that permit left? Okay. Just some companies don't allow their drivers to make left turns. All turns have to be right. Okay. The worst thing we can do is allow a permit left. When I spoke to your other engineers about this earlier, this was like a secondary thing. Uh, you needed a roundabout because you had to raise medians. Now, if there wasn't a high instance of accidents in the business corridor heading north and south on 60 there, uh, would you still consider a roundabout to be the best option if, th if that wasn't the case with the raised medians for the accidents at, at the intersection? I definitely would. The region would perceive it that way, but definitely myself. I mean, the simulation is real. Not, and I have no benefit to how the roundabout to make it look better than it's going to be on the ground. No benefit whatsoever. That's probably what you're going to be looking at at a PMD. Very good flow, very safe, very efficient, and even the ARP recommends roundabouts one of the top ten ways to address our growing elderly viral population. It's not a complex thing. You get to the yield line, you look left, if no one's coming, you roll into the intersection. Depth perception is one of the things that we struggle with as we get older. It's almost really a non-issue with a roundabout because it's lower speed and closer as compared to a permitted left to say the intersection now. Okay. Um, 
And the uh, statistics that were provided in the report, I believe it was over a three-year period at the intersection, there was 41 accidents and 61 at, through the corridor, I believe, the 102 total. Um, given the volume of traffic, I, I roughly estimated between the 20 and 60 intersection and the 90, it was like uh, 8.7 million in a year. Now you're telling me that if you divide it out, the accidents there, even at the intersection, was like 13 accidents with almost 9 million cars traveling through it. I just, it baffles me that that was higher than an average uh, yeah, number of accidents. Uh, Doug, I can answer that. When we did the uh, study, we looked at the intersection rate for the approaches as well as for the intersection. And the rates are calculated differently for, uh, for a linear section of roadway. The unit of measurement for accidents is number of accidents per million vehicle miles travel, whereas inside an intersection, the unit is million entering vehicles. So those are the two different ways to calculate it. But the bottom line is same. You come up with a threshold for uh, similar type facilities throughout the state. And, and then when you do an accident analysis at one location, or uh, rather, I should say accident analysis, we, uh, when uh, our traffic and safety officers looking at accident data for linear segments or an intersection, they use the rate uh, to see if it's above or below the statewide average. If it's above statewide average, it gets uh, flagged and there is a list of uh, locations where accident rates are deemed higher than statewide average and they are sent to the region, like Buffalo, Western New York is one region and it's sent to us for us to investigate what can you do about it. So we do an investigation, and sometimes the result of the investigation is, no, we cannot do anything about it. A perfect example would be, let's say the number of accidents at an intersection is higher than statewide average. But you look at the uh, accidents, plot them, and you find out there is no pattern. There are uh, some accidents, let's say three accidents caused by uh, deer running across the road. Two or three of them are distracted driving. Two or three of them are under the influence. Two or three are weather condition. Two or th so there is no one particular pattern. For, in this case, in this intersection, the accident rate was higher than statewide average. Those 41 accidents did tip the scale in favor of it being uh, flagged as a high accident location. When we did the investigation, we found out that the out of those 41 accidents, the number of accidents that were caused by head-on or left-turn accidents were very small. So roundabout was not initially uh, uh, proposed as a treatment for reducing accidents at the intersection because the the accident, uh, the, the if you look at the pattern of accidents, there was no overwhelming reason to put in a roundabout for safety reasons. The reason we are installing the roundabout is so that a large truck that comes down from the throughway can make a U-turn out there. I, they can find some other place to do it. But since we are installing the raised median, we are blocking their path to uh, make a turn and go back towards the throughway. And that's why we propose the roundabout. But when you put in a roundabout in place of signalized intersection, the number of accidents go down. You know, whatever few accidents you're having will go down especially the severity, just as Howard explained and we showed earlier, because the probability of head-on and right-angle accidents or higher-speed accidents, higher-angle accidents go down. So uh, there is inherent benefit to putting in a roundabout, but the project is not driven by roundabout, as uh, uh, the attorney from the city on the other side was saying, that we put in a roundabout and we extended the median. I think he's He's saying the wrong thing. That's not what the, this project was about, the left turn accidents in and out of the commercial driveways. And the raised median is a treatment, and the uh, roundabout is being proposed to address the mobility issue that is being raised because of the raised median. All right, we're in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna try and continue now. I know you've, you've made several comments. Well, thank you, thank you for letting us make the comments, and thank you for coming here. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for your time. Anyone else in the first row? In row two? I just had to ask. You had to give us your name and. Okay. I'm Tennessee Landis, I'm the mayor of Fredonia. And um, 
overall, I'm very supportive of the whole project because I think it's going to, as you said, um, at least um, diminish the, the severity of the accidents. However, I heard one question, and maybe I, you covered it, I apologize, I was in another meeting, uh, that made some kind of sense to me. Uh, in the afternoon, 2.30 in the afternoon, car, uh, all the buses come out of the school. So at that time, the traffic stops. What's gonna happen to the roundabout when, like to the traffic going there, uh, when the, um, they have to stop traffic so all the buses come out of the school? I thought that was a valid question. Okay, so well, on the image now, so the school's down here. So there's traffic back through the intersection during that. Okay, so traffic's gonna back right through the roundabout. I was gonna sit there for that minute. As soon as the bus is clear and they allow the traffic to, a minute later, the roundabout will be clear again. There's actually a roundabout interchange in Brighton, Colorado, where a rail line shuts the roadway down for eight minutes. It's about right through a whole roundabout interchange. As soon as the gates go up, traffic just sorts themselves down. Would it be great if they didn't have to stop traffic for those couple of times? I was kind of surprised when I heard that when I got here today that that, that actually goes on. Do they really need to? Uh, actually, uh, uh, we did receive a call from the uh, superintendent of the school. Uh, Craig and I had a conference call with them and the school board and addressed this very issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody here in the next row? Sir. Here in Terrell, um, they're going to build a hospital of 19 beds, hospital or 29 bed hospital um, toward the east a little more. With the school, the hospital, and the uh, air traffic, isn't that going to be a problem? With ambulances going through there all the time? I can, I can bring up a video of the ground I caught one when I was down in Rehobo Beach, Delaware, on vacation. They really have no issue with it, as long as the cars didn't pull over to the side. The worst thing of a driver is at the yield line and say a fire truck comes up behind him and they just sit there. They get on the horn, the driver then pulls out, gets out of the way, and the emergency vehicle continues on. Uh, we've heard this comment a lot about concerns about emergency vehicles getting through, but how, how big of a hospital did you say it is? They're going to build a 29 bed hospital, so, which is a ridiculous thing, but anyways, it's, they've got the money to do it, they're doing it. So, do you really think you'd get more than 30 ambulances a day? Because that would be more more people in the hospital can even hold. No, I'm not, I'm not worried about the number of hospitals or ambulances. I'm worried about the rest of the time. The fact that you're going to build a hospital is a ridiculous thing. Okay, moving back toward the back. Anyone in the next row? Yeah. Hi, Kara Cristina. Village resident. I'm also um, a Fredonia trustee, um, and I certainly would not want to do anything that would hinder um, the businesses, um, you know, people from getting to the businesses. However, um, I have been to many places um, that have roundabouts. We just came back from a trip to Hilton Head, South Carolina, and they have many roundabouts there, and they have much more traffic than we have in Fredonia. Um, especially at peak tourist time. And there are many, many businesses and restaurants, many more businesses and restaurants and schools um, and office buildings than we have in Fredonia. And it, it really does move the traffic um, and they have sidewalks and um, it, it seems to be a good thing for them. So I'm hoping that the possibility is that this could be a good thing for us as well. Obviously it didn't bring back any warm weather for us. <laughs> have snow in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So, uh, well, not the kind of snow that we have. Not our snow. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy Steger. I'm a resident, and um, I also travel pretty extensively, especially downstate, several times a month, and I go through several traffic circles, large traffic circles, um, as I head down there, both on the east and the west side of the Hudson River. And they are spectacular, the way they work. It's really amazing. It's elegant, the way that everything goes through there. It's quite incredible. So I am also very much in favor of 
the traffic circle as long as we can get used to it as a community, as long as the businesses would not be adversely affected. I, I understand the concerns of the McDonald's there, and I wondered if you're traveling north on Route 60 from the traffic circle and you get to the light by, um, I think it's Walmart, will there be some kind of signage there that says they can make a U-turn there? as there are in many other communities. You know, they'll tell you where you can and cannot make a U-turn. Would that be a safe place to put a sign saying, U-turn here? It's not wide enough. OK. OK. All right, that was, that was one concern. My other concern really isn't, you know, it's the center part. You said earlier that the state doesn't like to keep up the center portion of it, so I don't want it to get all weedy and you know look horrible. And I'm I would like to propose a community um, partnership, maybe with the college, to put up some kind of large piece of art to welcome people into the community. Actually, uh, that's already in the works. Uh, Mayor Landis could probably provide you more details uh, as per what, what we had planned that uh, center island in the middle, be inside of the truck apron, is uh, wide enough that uh, what we are going to do is we are going to have, give it a gentle slope from the edges to the middle so that it goes up to about 42 inch eye height. What, well, the reason we are raising it 42 inches is so that it provides a visual uh, barrier to vehicles coming from the opposite side. And it does also protects you from the glare from uh, traffic from the other side. And we are going to have some landscaping on that uh, sloped uh, uh, area inside. And it will lead up to the middle. In the middle, we are going to have a 10-foot diameter concrete pad or plinth. And we are going to provide a water line so that you can uh, water the landscaping. And uh, uh, light uh, will provide a light connection so that you can provide up lighting for any artwork you want to place. Uh, Mayor Landis has more detail on it. In terms of the sidewalks, who would be responsible for plowing them? Would that be the state? Would be that the town? Who, who would plow the snow off the sidewalks in the winter? It's definitely not the state. It's uh, every, every, play, every community, every community that uh, in, in New York State, uh, the rule is same. It's, it's not that the rule is going to be different in Fredonia or Pomfret. The rule is same everywhere. It's the community, it's the township that ha is responsible for. The, in most communities, the townships transfer the, the uh, uh, responsibility for snow and ice removal to the property owner of the frontage. I, mean, I live in Amherst, and uh, I have 250 feet of sidewalk. It's, it's not fun when you have to go out there at minus 20 degree wind chill to remove, but it's my responsibility and I have to do it. Okay, anyone here in the back? Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment? All right, well then, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming to our meeting tonight. We had a, quite a good turnout. We, we've, we've received a lot of comments. We'll, uh, you, you, you can also send comments in in writing if you'd like to. There's uh, comment sheets in the brochure. As Sonny said, please send your comments in within the next two weeks. We will give careful consideration to all the comments that we have received, and then we will determine how to move forward from there. Thank you very much.